In this lecture, we will go over the level 1 reading on understanding business cycles. In this reading, we focus on short-term movements in economic activity. And this is a little different from the previous reading where we took a longer term view. Specifically in this reading, we will talk about the business cycle and how labor, equipment utilization and other variables change with the business cycle. We'll talk about different theories which explain the business cycle. We'll talk about unemployment and inflation and specifically how these variables change with the business cycle. And finally, we will cover economic indicators. Let's start with a definition of the business cycle. And this definition has been taken straight from the curriculum. I want you to pause the video and read this definition. The curriculum emphasizes four points and these are very important because two of the four points are tested in the practice problems at the end of the reading. So I think there is a reasonable chance that this might show up on the exam. The first point is that business cycles typically happen in economies where we have business enterprises or private enterprises. So there are lots of companies, private companies that are producing goods and services and households are working for those private goods and households provide the labor for those businesses. So that's point number one. Point number two has to do with the fact that we have cycles. So we have cycles of expansion and these cycles of expansion are followed by recessions. So we generally have economic activity that moves up and down. So I'll put two here associated with the cycle. Third point is that when we have an increase in economic activity, generally there are many activities, many economic activities that are improving at the same time and when there is a decline then there are many activities or economic activities which are deteriorating at the same time. So that is point number three that we have many economic activities improving or decreasing at the same time. And the fourth point has to do with the fact that the sequence of events is recurrent but not periodic. Recurrent means that these cycles repeat. So you have an improvement in the economy and then there is a decline and then there'll be an improvement and so on. Not periodic means that the intensity and the duration are not necessarily the same. If we had said that the cycle is periodic, then that would mean that the intensity is always the same and the length of each cycle is the same, but that is not the case. So there is a question at the back which tests you on this point and remember the fact that cycles are recurrent and not periodic. So make sure you are on top of these four points. Broadly speaking, there are four stages of the business cycle. And before I get into the specific stages, let's make sure we understand the x-axis and the y-axis. x-axis here is simply time and the y-axis is the level of national economic activity. So if we are looking at a given country, we are talking about the economic activity in that country. This straight line is a trend line and you can think of this as the potential GDP. So in general, over here, the potential GDP is trending upwards. The red curve over here represents the real GDP at any point in time. So notice here the real GDP is below potential. So we are in a recession here. The economy is overheated in the sense that the real GDP is above potential and so on. Now let's look at the four stages. The first one mentioned here is an expansion where the real GDP is increasing. 
So here the real GDP is increasing. And notice that this expansion phase can be broken down into two sub parts. Let's call it part A and B. This would be 1A where we are in an early expansion and this part would be 1B which is a late expansion. Then the economy peaks before coming down. We can call this point 2 where the economy has peaked and then we come to 3 contraction recession. So this is where the economy is now slowing down and part four then would be a trough this is where the economy bottoms out the curriculum does not show the aggregate demand aggregate supply curves over here but i want to very quickly connect this material with what we saw in the previous reading when we are at a peak here is what's happening going back to the pictures that we saw in the last reading if we have real GDP or output on the x-axis and price level on the y-axis, let's say that this represents our potential GDP at a given point in time and we are drawing a picture for the peak. At the peak, we'll have a situation where aggregate demand and short-run aggregate supply intersect to the right of potential GDP. This is called an expansionary gap and that is the situation that we have over here when we are in a trough situation four then the aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply will intersect to the left of potential gdp notice that in situation two the real gdp or output is greater than or to the right of potential gdp Here all we have done is reproduced exhibit one from the curriculum where we look at variables such as economic activity, employment and so on across different stages of the business cycle. The points related to economic activity are self-evident because the cycle is showing economic activity. What is more interesting is employment. So what happens to employment during the business cycle? Let's start over here. We are in a trough. So this is the bottom of the business cycle, lowest level of activity. And in the early expansion, we are slowly coming out of that trough. What happens here is that layoffs slow, which means that our net employment has turned positive. You can think of this as follows. As the economy was declining, clearly layoffs were increasing. Once we bottom over here, we reach the bottom and the economy seems to be turning around, then layoffs stop and potentially hiring starts picking up. So the net effect is that we have positive overall employment. So employment starts increasing slowly but cautiously. Unemployment rates are still relatively high over here and what businesses do is turn towards overtime and temporary employees because businesses are still not sure whether they are fully out of the recession. Then in the late expansion, so as we get into this phase, once it is clear that we are well into the expansion phase, businesses begin full-time rehiring as overtime hours rise. So there is rehiring and there is more overtime and unemployment falls to low levels. As we keep going up this curve, it is quite possible that our employment in the economy goes beyond full employment, which means that the economy is producing above potential GDP. And then the economy reaches a peak, or we should say the economic activity reaches a peak. Here, business slows its rate of hiring. However, unemployment rate continues to fall. You can think of it as a momentum effect. Businesses are still hiring over here. And finally, once we get to this phase where we are in a 
contraction phase or the economy starts slowing down, then businesses first cut hours and freeze hiring. So overtime hours and temporary workers are cut. And then that is followed by outright layoffs. And slowly, the unemployment rate begins to rise. Let's see if you can answer this question now. At what stage of the cycle is labor productivity likely to be the highest? And this also connects with the previous reading. Labor productivity is output divided by the total amount of labor, let's say in terms of aggregate hours. This might seem a little bit counterintuitive, but this number is the highest when we are here in a trough. And the reason is when we are in a trough, the labor or the quantity of labor is significantly low. Output is also low because we are at the bottom of an economic or a business cycle, but it is not as low or not that low compared to labor. So overall, this ratio tends to be relatively high when we are in a trough. So remember this fact, it is somewhat testable. Continuing with the business cycle characteristics, this is the bottom part of exhibit one. I want you to read the material on the slide. It is fairly self-evident, but I will emphasize a couple of points here. Upturn often most pronounced in housing, durable consumer items and orders for light producer equipment. Why is this the case? If you think about it, during a recession, as the economy is slowing down, consumers generally will avoid buying new houses because they are not sure whether they will still have their job or not. They will also avoid durable consumer items. So if they are thinking of buying a new car, for example, they will hold off on that and try to extend the life of their existing car. But once the economy turns around and people are a little more confident then here in the early expansion housing picks up people start thinking about buying houses and actually start buying houses maybe people start buying new cars so there is a marked turnaround over here from a business perspective orders for light producer equipment also start going up because in this phase, the business outlook was bleak. So companies actually stopped all sorts of orders, even small orders and big orders. But as the economy turns around, then orders for light equipment start picking up. The rest of the content here, as I said earlier, is fairly self-evident. So make sure you read it. Also, I want you to read example one very carefully. This gives you some information and then they are two MCQ type questions. The most important point here is that a commonly used definition of a recession is when we have two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth. But as the example points out, there are issues with that definition. So you can read the example to understand the issues, but just recognize the fact that a commonly used definition is two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth. Another interesting question from an investment manager perspective is where to invest during different stages of the business cycle. As you might imagine, this is a very practical question. The curriculum does give us some indications of what to do, but this is not explicitly a learning objective. So I'll just cover this briefly and then move on. In this section, we'll talk about resource use through the business cycle. The high level point is that economic fluctuations impact all these variables and these variables impact the economic fluctuations. So for example, if there is a economic downturn, that will cause capital spending to go down or to slow down. 
and reduction in investments reduction in capital spending will have an impact on the economic situation or the economic activity and similarly we can see with consumer behavior for example if the economy is slowing down obviously the consumer demand will come down if consumer demand comes down then that itself has a negative impact on the economic activity we'll discuss these items in more detail over subsequent slides let's take a very basic scenario over here when there is an economic downturn aggregate demand shifts down or to the left so let's draw some graphs over here going back to the material we saw in the previous reading price level on the y axis real gdp or output on the x axis let's say we have a situation initially where the real gdp is to the right of potential gdp if there is an economic downturn for whatever reason perhaps we have tighter monetary policy then aggregate demand will shift to the left or shift down when this starts happening then inventories will begin to accumulate since demand is low but companies initially are still producing at the same rate so inventories will build up as inventories build up then companies will slow down production because companies don't like the fact that inventory levels are going up when production slows down then there is low utilization of equipment and we have idling workers initially companies will not lay off workers they will simply cut back on overtime if the economy then recovers then we are back to normal but if the economy doesn't recover and it appears that the economy is heading for a recession then companies might take more severe measures such as laying off people and that is going to hurt employment numbers now let's look at this question over here draw the recessionary out put gap using the short run aggregate supply long run aggregate supply and aggregate demand curves we've already done part of this so this is the long run aggregate supply this is the aggregate demand which went down now let's say with this aggregate demand going down consumer confidence has also come down so consumer demand has come down and our aggregate demand shifts further to the left if the aggregate demand shifts further to the left then our real gdp will come to this point and we will end up with a recessionary output gap that gap is this distance over here between the real gdp at this stage and the potential gdp spending on new capital equipment is sensitive to the business cycle this is quite self evident when the business cycle slows down economic activity reduces obviously profits and cash flow come down if profits and cash flow are down then companies hold back on capital investment shifts in capital spending in my example the reduction in capital spending will then impact the economic cycle and this will happen in three stages stage 1 this is where businesses see demand falling businesses then will reduce capital expenditure the most basic and simple way of reducing capital expenditure is to cut down on maintenance cost so that will come down companies will halt new orders if possible companies will also cancel existing orders generally small orders are easy to cancel large orders such as orders for major construction equipment and so on might take a little longer to cancel all of these items are going to have a negative impact on the economy so notice the fact that the economic cycle is impacting capital investment and then the reduction in capital investment is having a negative impact on the economy so these two items impact each other and 
reinforce each other to some extent. Then in stage two, the economy begins its initial recovery. So we are out of the trough and the economy starts improving. Capital spending will improve because of the growth in earnings and possibly some orders which were cancelled over here in stage one will be reinstated. And then stage three, now we are late in the cyclic upturn. Capital spending focused on capacity expansion. So notice earlier we were maybe placing orders for small equipment. But as we get deeper into the economic cycle and it is clear that we are improving, then companies might run out of capacity. And so at this stage, companies will try to expand. So get larger equipment, maybe expand factory space, construct new factories and so on. So those larger investments will happen here in stage three, which is late in the cyclic upturn. As an analyst, you might wonder what indicator do we look at to determine the level of capital spending? And the indicator that we look at most often is orders for capital equipment. When these orders are going up, that means that companies are spending more money or plan to spend more money on physical capital. Now do example two from the curriculum. This has two MCQ type questions. The first one requires common sense. We've not explicitly talked about the subject matter, but you should be able to figure it out. And question two is straightforward. We have talked about the content of question number two on this slide. Fluctuations in inventory levels. Inventory increase and decrease happens very rapidly and has a major effect on economic growth despite small size. The point here is that relative to the overall buying or overall demand in an economy, the amount of money spent on inventory is relatively small. But changes in inventory have a substantial effect and we will see why. An important ratio to look at is this one right here, inventory divided by sales. And we will look at how this ratio changes over multiple stages. Let's say stage one is where we are at the top of our economic cycle. At this point, sales begin to come down. So if you look at your inventory to sales ratio, we are saying that sales are beginning to come down, but companies are still producing. And if they are producing, because it takes a while to cut back on production, inventory levels will keep going up. So notice what happens to this ratio. Denominator down, numerator up. So overall, the inventory to sales ratio will go up. But then eventually, as inventory levels go up, companies will cut back on production to reduce inventory. There will be layoffs and there will be cancelled orders and this will probably exaggerate the downturn. Then in stage two, our production rate is less than the sales rate. The way you can think of this is companies have built up large inventory. So obviously they want to slow the production rate down. As the production rate comes down, the inventory to sales ratio will fall. So you can think now in this stage, the inventory numbers start coming down quite fast. So the ratio will come down. Once inventory to sales is at a normal level, then the production is increased even though sales might still not be up. And then stage three, this is where sales begin their cyclic upturn. Initially, production does not keep pace with sales. So our sales numbers start going up, which means that overall this ratio will initially come down. Then there will be a surge in production, 
and there will be a turn in hiring patterns which means that now more people will be hired. From a testability perspective, it is important to understand how the inventory to sales ratio changes across these three stages. Before moving to the next slide, I also want to emphasize that inventory increase and decrease happens very rapidly. The curriculum also uses the terminology that inventory moves up and down forcefully and that has a major impact on economic growth. Now I want you to do example three, which consists of a few MCQ type questions based on the material that we have seen on the slide. We now come to consumer behavior. This is important because in developed countries, this tends to be the largest sector of the economy. In the United States, for example, the consumer sector represents 70% of the overall economy. Patterns of household consumption determine overall economic direction of the economy more than any other sector. A major indicator of household consumption is retail sales. And you will notice, therefore, that analysts watch the retail sales numbers very carefully. From a testability perspective, it is important to note that many analysts make a distinction between durable goods, non-durable goods and services. The demand for durable goods tends to be much more sensitive to the business cycle relative to the demand for non-durable goods and services. A classic example of a durable good would be a car. And as I mentioned earlier, if the economy is heading downwards, so consumers are not too confident about their income in the future, they are likely to hold back on the purchase of durable goods such as cars, whereas non-durable goods such as food items, there the consumption will remain. Also, the demand for basic services will not be as sensitive to the business cycle as the demand for durable goods. So that's why durables are more sensitive to the economic cycle. Analysts also look for growth in income because a higher income would indicate higher consumption, which would indicate that the aggregate demand curve would be shifting to the right. But many analysts focus on what's called permanent income. The way you can think of this is as follows. Overall income can be broken into a component called permanent income and temporary income. Permanent income is the income that consumers are confident of. So people are pretty sure that in the foreseeable future, they will continue to earn a certain amount. That is permanent income. And then temporary income might be income that they get because stock prices are up or dividends are up. And by definition, this is temporary. Increases in permanent income are a much better indication of savings rates and consumption relative to the overall income number. So that's why analysts will be more concerned with increases or changes in permanent income. Now I want you to do example four from the curriculum. The housing sector is a smaller part of the overall economy compared with consumer spending, but can move up and down very quickly. This is somewhat comparable to durable goods. The way you can think of this is as follows. If consumers have a negative outlook on the economy, then the demand for housing can slow down very fast. And therefore, and since the demand for housing can either increase or decrease very rapidly, this sector can count more in the overall economic movements than the sector's relatively small size might suggest. Generally, statistics on housing are easily available in developed countries and analysts pay a lot of attention to these numbers. As you might imagine, 
most people in the developed world buy houses on mortgage therefore the housing sector is very sensitive to interest rates when interest rates are down then demand for housing tends to be up the curriculum makes a point that the housing sector might follow its own internal cycle as i just mentioned when interest rates are low that's a benefit let's say that overall housing prices are low for some reason relative to income then the combined effect of low interest rates and relatively low housing cost might increase the demand for housing the sector is very sensitive to demographics if a lot of people are moving into a given region then demand will go up a critical variable to look at is the rate of family formation so if we have a large number of people in the in the 25 to 40 age range then chances are that the rate of family formulation will be up which will imply a higher demand for housing there might also be some speculative buying in the housing sector where people might buy houses if they expect housing prices to increase in the future now i want you to do example 5 from the curriculum and all these examples are extremely useful because they are mcq type questions and very indicative of what you might see on the actual exam finally we come to the external trade sector behavior i will touch on this briefly because we have a full reading on the subject later the size of the sector varies from country to country you might imagine that in a country like singapore this would be significant whereas for the united states the external trade sector is small relative to the domestic economy a few general points imports rise with domestic gdp growth so if there is substantial growth within a given domestic economy then that tends to increase imports so people become richer it is easier for them to buy goods from other countries and simplistically exports rise with growth in the rest of the world so if the rest of the world is becoming richer then the demand from the rest of the world will go up which means that exports will increase also currency value has a major impact on imports and exports and this again will be covered in a later reading but simplistically if the currency becomes less valuable then the exports will increase now i want you to do example 6 from the curriculum 